Hey everyone, my name is Houston Chandler. I'm Director of Science for the Orient Society and currently a PhD candidate at Virginia Tech. Today I'm going to talk to you about eastern indigo snakes and tell you a little bit about eastern indigo snake conservation um, and where we've come recently with this species. So I'll start out, I'll talk a little bit about eastern indigo snake ecology, um, just sort of tell you what an eastern indigo snake is, and then I'll spend most of my time talking about all the conservation work that has gone on for this species. Um, and then at the end, I'll bring it all together and look into the future and see whether all this conservation work is likely um, to be successful. So eastern indigo snakes are really cool animals, fascinating snakes. They are the longest snake in North America. Uh, male indigo snakes can reach lengths of seven or even eight feet in rare cases. So they are really big snakes. Um, they have large home ranges. They move a lot into different habitat types, um, depending on what, type, what time of year it is. Um, they're also famous and well known for eating other snakes. You can see in the top right photo, um, this indigo snake is actually eating an eastern diamondback rattlesnake. They eat actually lots of uh, venomous snakes. And so they're, they have a very good reputation amongst the public compared to some other snake species. Um, so overall, they're really interesting animals. They are native to the southeastern U.S. Uh, their historic range would have put them in Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and basically all of Florida. And the important thing about this region is that it is a landscape ruled by fire. Um, the Longleaf Pine ecosystem would have historically covered basically the entire indigo snake range, except for maybe the very southern portion um, of Florida. And longleaf pine forests really depend on regular wildfires to maintain the vegetation structure that you see in this photo. So that is an overstory of um, relatively open pine uh, and then an understory of thick grass and other vegetation. And so without these regular wildfires, you really lose um, this vegetation structure that is characteristic of this ecosystem. The other important landscape feature for indigo snakes is their reliance on gopher tortoise burrows. And this is especially true in about the northern half um, of their range. So gopher tortoises are large terrestrial tortoises that dig these deep 20 to 30 foot burrows um, into sandy soils. And these burrows provide habitat for upwards of 300 other species. And that's because the burrows are uh, relatively stable in temperature and humidity. So animals can go into these burrows to survive environmental conditions, say cold weather, um, that they may not be able to survive otherwise. And there's really no substitute or other habitat feature on the landscape that can act exactly like these tortoise burrows. So they really are a critical um, landscape feature in these longleaf pine forests uh, throughout the range of the gopher tortoise. Now, unfortunately, eastern indigo snake populations have actually declined um, over the last hundred years. They are basically completely extirpated from the western portion of their range. Um, for sure, they are not in Alabama and Mississippi anymore, and there has not been one seen in the panhandle of Florida in many years, and even extreme southwestern Georgia. Um, so they've experienced an overall range constriction and are now there's only population strongholds really in peninsular Florida and uh, central Georgia. There's many reasons for this population for these population declines. Uh, she might expect overall loss of habitat and fragmentation of remaining habitat or the primary primary drivers um, for indigo snake population declines. Longleaf pine forests exist today at less than 3% of their historic range. Um, so this dramatic loss of habitat has certainly led to just an overall smaller area that indigo snakes can inhabit in today's world. And then combined with a loss of habitat, you've seen uh, long-term fire suppression. People don't really like it when wildfires burn unchecked. Um, across the landscape. So natural wildfires have been basically completely eliminated from this landscape. Um, and that leads to habitat degradation that some species like indigo snakes um, can't live when the habitat isn't regularly burned. And these two factors have also contributed to gopher tortoise population declines. You can see an example of that. 
um, in the bottom right graph. And so declining gopher tortoise populations simply mean that those burrows that the indigo snakes need to overwinter, those just aren't on the landscape anymore, and indigo snakes can't persist when they aren't there. And the other main factor that contributed to indigo snake declines uh, was over collection for the pet trade. They are popular in the pet trade. They are big, impressive snakes. Um, people like to keep them as pets. And so many individuals were historically collected um, and sold uh, so that people could keep them as pets. There's also a host of other uh, less important factors, but factors nonetheless that can contribute directly to indigo snake mortality. Um, and so that's things like road mortality, direct persecution from humans, uh, gassing of tortoise burrows to collect indigo snakes uh, for rattlesnake roundups. This doesn't happen anymore, at least not to the extent it used to, but certainly when you're pouring gasoline down a gopher tortoise burrow, um, that's not good for any of the species that are in it. Uh, there's issues with things like disease. You've probably heard about snake fungal disease, which has been well publicized in recent years. Uh, we know that it's in indigo snake populations. We don't really know what it's doing um, to those populations, but it is there. There are a host of non-native species that call the southeast home. Um, things like feral pigs, fire ants. Uh, again, we don't really understand how these species are impacting things like indigo snakes, but they are there and there are anecdotal appoint, uh, accounts of either habitat destruction or direct mortality from these introduced species. And then finally, the other challenge for indigo snake conservation is that we don't know a lot about this snake, or at least we didn't, um, and you'll hear a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and so it's challenging to make informed conservation decisions that will benefit populations if you don't know a lot about the species um, in question. And so all of these factors led the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to list eastern indigo snakes as threatened in 1978. And this, had two import this did two important things. It dramatically reduced collection um, for the pet trade and commerce of indigo snakes. And that happened basically as soon as they were listed. So that really removed one of the main threats um, to existing indigo snake populations. And then it also increased awareness um, just in general about indigo snakes and also specifically reduced the threat of development to known populations. So if you go to a uh, construction site somewhere in the indigo snake range, you're likely to see signs like this um, informing people about indigo snakes and uh, telling them what to do if they see an indigo snake um, while doing construction. And so those were positives. It's important for the public uh, to understand that the species is there and that to know that it's uh, listed and not to harm it. Now, unfortunately, after they were listed in 1978, not a lot happened for the next 30 years um, in the form of large-scale indigo snake conservation. Um, they were listed, but really nothing. There were no large-scale projects um, to benefit indigo snakes really at the uh, at their range-wide scale. And that started to change really in 2008 when the Orion Society was founded um, as a family uh, foundation focused specifically on indigo snake conservation. Um, the Orion Society has since transitioned to a nonprofit uh, but still works uh, extensively with eastern indigo snakes and practices conservation um, through land management, scientific research, and education. So over the last 12 years, we've really seen a ton of work on indigo snake conservation, um, and the initiation of the Orion Society was really um, kind of the push for a lot of this work. So the first thing, like I mentioned, in 2008, we really lacked robust data um, to make conservation decisions. And so since that time, there's been a ton of research on indigo snakes. Um, there have been over 25 uh, peer-reviewed publications describing indigo snake ecology, their genetics, behavior, all sorts of things that give us a better picture of this species and can really um, help us narrow down things uh, that we need to do to promote their conservation. However, even with all this work, we still struggle to model populations in a statistically meaningful way. So snakes are notoriously hard to study. They're hard to find. They're hard to find um, reliably over time. And so we still have a hard time understanding how their populations are fluctuating, fluctuating through time. 
the other thing that we didn't have um, back in 2008 was some way to understand um, at a large spatial scale how indigo snakes and their populations were persisting across the landscape. And so some of the early research made it very clear um, their dependence on gopher tortoise burrows so that when they're sheltering, they're at these burrows um, over 80% of the time in the fall and winter. And that information was used to design a monitoring scheme across South Georgia where we go out to sandhill sites with tortoise burrows that could support indigo snake populations. And we essentially go from burrow to burrow to look for indigo snakes. And this has been a really effective way to survey for indigo snakes at large spatial scales. Um, if we go to sites where there is in fact an indigo snake population, we are detecting a snake or a shed skin um, approximately 50% of those times, which is very good um, for snakes. And this gives us a broad, large picture of how indigo snake populations are doing across the landscape in Georgia. So this kind of long-term monitoring is really critical um, to understanding if current conservation work is actually having an effect. And then the other thing that's happened is that there's been a ton of both land acquisitions and land management work um, to improve longleaf pine habitat throughout the indigo snake range. Um, all these properties with red arrows have been either purchased or expanded over the last 12 years, um, and many of them actually support indigo snake populations today. In addition to purchasing the land, there's been lots of work to restore the habitat. So this includes things like planting longleaf pine trees, um, harvesting and planting native grass seed to restore these grasses to the forest floor. And then tons of work every year goes into uh, prescribing fire across this landscape. So like I already mentioned, longleaf pine forests uh, need prescribed fire to maintain this vegetation structure. Um, and so it's not going to happen naturally anymore. Um, people actually have to go out and set the fires. Uh, and a lot of habitat, thousands and thousands of acres have been improved um, through the regular uh, prescription of wildfire. So what have we learned during this process about working with indigo snakes and rebuilding um, the longleaf pine ecosystem uh, essentially from scratch in many places? Focusing on conservation at the ecosystem level has generally been more successful and sustainable than single species projects. It's hard to get continual funding and continual support for projects just focused on indigo snakes. But if you talk about providing habitat for hundreds, if not thousands of other species, um, that's often a more sustainable way to approach conservation. With that said, gopher tortoises are actually so important to longleaf pine ecosystems in the places where they occur that there's been a large scale push in the last several years um, just focused around gopher tortoise conservation, um, particularly in Georgia. And this has protected thousands of acres and is a really uh, actually kind of a counterintuitive way to conserve habitat when you have this species that is so important that people are willing um, to do the work and to support it uh, just for that species. So at a broad scale, ecosystem conservation is great, but if you have a species like gopher tortoise that is important, um, that'll work too. Another important thing is that private landowner partnerships are really critical. Um, the majority of the land in the southeastern U.S. is privately owned. And so if you don't work with these people that have this habitat still on their property, you're never going to be successful at broad spatial scales of conserving this species. Um, so, and these are two brothers that the Orient Society has worked with for many years. Uh, they both have indigo snakes on their property and have been champions of longleaf pine conservation. And so it's really important to forge these partnerships and to work with um, private landowners. And then finally, when talking about the benefits of this kind of work, especially prescribed fire and things, it's important to speak to the effectiveness of land management and that its benefits are widespread. It benefits indigo snakes, of course, but it also benefits many other species that people may care more about um, than indigo snakes. So deer, turkey, quail, um, those arguments go a long way to increasing support for this kind of work. Now, I showed you in the beginning that indigo snakes across their range, they've actually experienced a pretty significant range contraction. 
And so early on in the indigo snake conservation work, it was decided that for conservation to overall be successful, we needed to repatriate or uh, reestablish indigo snake pos con populations in the part of their range uh, where they aren't anymore. And so now today there's actually two reintroduction sites, one in Southern Alabama and one in the Florida Panhandle. And the, each site gets yearly releases of indigo snakes that are bred in captivity um, at the Orient Center for Indigo Conservation. Um, those snakes are reared until they are a little bit larger and they're, then they're released right onto the landscape um, in these areas that have suitable habitat. Some things about introductions that have come up over the course of 10 years working on this project. Um, reintroductions really require a long-term commitment. All conservation requires a long-term commitment, but with reintroductions, you can put a lot of money and time and effort into them. But if you don't continue to support them and continue to release snakes, uh, they're not likely to be successful. And so this is in terms of things like funding and research and monitoring. People have to be out there to determine whether the reintroductions are working. Um, so it really takes a long-term commitment from many partners. You have to identify appropriate release sites. So obviously these snakes decline for some reason. So if you haven't addressed the initial reasons for population declines, you can release all the snakes you want. You're not likely to be successful. Um, so it's very important to pick a site that has suitable habitat for these snakes. And then you must be able to breed enough snakes for annual releases. Um, if you can't breed enough snakes to sustain the releasing um, of individuals each year, you're not going to be able to have enough snakes on the landscape where they, they can support um, a self-reproducing population. So it's really important to think carefully about how you breed snakes in captivity and how you sustain that captive colony while not endangering the existing uh, wild eastern indigo snake populations. All right, so that's kind of a whirlwind tour across eastern indigo snake conservation. Um, so will all this work be successful long term? Will indigo snakes be here in 100, 200, 300 years? Um, many of the threats that remain for eastern indigo snake populations are unlikely to go away. Habitat is not going to be uh, stopped being developed by humans. If you look at the development models for Florida over the next 50 uh, years or so, a lot of development is, is going to continue to happen um, in the indigo snake range. And that means that indigo snakes will probably continue to persist. We're pretty good about managing and having good habitat, but that they're going to be restricted to large tracts of public and private land um, that, like I said, are properly managed. You're not going to have eastern indigo snakes just everywhere on the landscape like they would have once been um, because of the significant habitat loss that has happened and continues to happen. Reintroductions are likely going to be successful with continued funding and support. Um, we've actually seen some exciting evidence within the last year that uh, the population in Alabama, which has had about 170 snakes released there, is actually now the individuals have reproduced for the first time. Um, so these reintroductions likely will be successful. The habitat at both reintroduction sites is very good and very well managed. Um, so as long as all the partners um, stay involved and the commitment to them uh, is maintained, reintroductions likely will be uh, su successful and then could be expanded to other sites. And the last thing I'll say just to wrap up is that all of this work that I've talked about um, is really the combination of many different organizations and many different people dedicated to the conservation of this species. Um, it would not be possible without the support and involvement of all these different organizations. Um, and so it's very important when trying to do large scale conservation projects to have the support and the buy-in from different people, um, to utilize different facilities, for example, for captive breeding snakes. Um, and it really wouldn't be possible um, without the involvement of all these people. So thanks for listening. I hope you learned something about Eastern Indigo snakes. And please feel free to contact me if you have any questions um, about Indigo snakes uh, in the future. Thanks. <laughs>